My name is Sylvain. I'm going to be your host for tonight. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We have a ton of people joining us remotely. We also have quite a lot of people here. I think we've never had that room as uh, full as this since COVID started. So we're super, super happy to be having this demo day with everyone. Tonight, we have a pretty dense demo day. We'll be kicking things off with um, data science students, our data science students who went through six months of part-time bootcamp with us. And then we'll switch to web development pitches with 12 web development pitches. It's going to be a mix of part-time and full-time projects. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Sylvain. I'm, uh, I co-founded Le Wagon here back in 2016. Joining me tonight uh, in the team, we have Douglas, Jan, um, we have a ton of TAs in the back. I can't name all of them. I will most probably forget some names. <laughs> and so we are Le Wagon. So I just want to take a minute to introduce a little bit about Le Wagon just very quickly, because I know you are all here for the pitches. This is the real action. So very quickly, what Le Wagon is, uh, we are a coding bootcamp. We've been around in Tokyo for the past six years. It is a worldwide coding bootcamp, so we are in 40 cities, right? Uh, and here in Tokyo as well. We run here in Tokyo two different programs. We run a data science program, we run a web development programs, and those programs, we run them in two formats, full-time and part-time. So tonight, you'll actually be able to see the result of uh, what you can learn in those programs, both from data science as well as web development. So I'll start with a very short introduction about data science because these are the pitches that we'll be seeing first. We had six students going through our part-time data science program. So they went through all of the steps to become data scientists. They started with basic Python, started with um, data analysis, learning all of the popular Python libraries, then moved on to the big meat of the bootcamp, which is machine learning and deep learning. After that, they learned how to put their application to production, which actually you're going to be seeing tonight. We have two pretty cool products to display. We have two projects, two teams pitching, two data science team pitching tonight. And I guess this is what you're all waiting for. So we'll jump right into it. Without further ado, I would like to welcome the first pitch on stage, which is Nathan for an e-commerce app. Nathan, you're on. Good evening, everyone. Um, I like music. I like music a lot. And since I've been in Japan, I've been trying to collect Japanese records. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time on e-commerce sites like Mercari, refreshing and refreshing to try and get good deals. And one day while I was at work, I refreshed and I saw this record come up. Hiroshi Yoshimura's Green. It's an ambient record from the 80s, and it's not too well known, but I was pretty surprised to see it there. It's a rare record, and it was already sold when I saw it, even though it was the first on the search results. What I was even more surprised by was the price. In Japan, 2,000 yen. The last time it sold in America, almost 40 times that, 76,000 yen. And I thought there's got to be a better way than me just clicking and clicking and clicking and still missing records and great deals like these. So our solution is to take a record listing, an image from Mercari, and to classify it as one of the records from, in our case, 43 different targets. So Kuma, can you show them how it works? Kuma, can you maybe select that uh, Hikaru Utada record and we'll see how it works? Okay. And yeah, Utada Hikaru, first love. That's right. How about that spacey record right there? Okay. Tatsuro Yamashita, spacey. That's right, too. It, Kuma, can you actually go to Mercari and just find another Yamashita Tatsuro record, and we'll pull it in and see if it works. Yeah, big wave, that looks good. Why don't you just drag it over there? Okay, and what does it say? Ah, Tatsuro Yamashita, big wave. So how did we do this? Let's talk about the data. 
So one of our main sources of data was Mercari. We took images of listings from Mercari. And then and another source of our data was Discogs, which is a global record marketplace. It's the de facto global record marketplace. And it's a database for music and records. And so we took the images from both of these sites. From Discogs, we have the true record image, the true cover, um, and some additional data. Um, so what did we do? So first, we tried doing feature extraction and perceptual hashing. And perceptual hashing is a technique for getting a digital fingerprint of an image. Um, so you can compare two images, and you can see how similar they are, like a fingerprint. Um, it's resistant to slight shifts in color or even rotations or the additions of watermarks like the image on the right here. It has a sticker on it. Uh, but p hashing, perceptual hashing, that's a technique that'll work for that. But there are some problems. It's not resistant to cropping or the addition of big backgrounds. And so this image on the right, the left side of the record cover is cropped off. It's not that great of an image. And so perceptual hashing, that technique doesn't work that well. But the image on the left, it'll work as long as we can extract the image. So we had to do feature extraction. So like I said, the record on the left has a black background. It's really good. It's not that hard to isolate that image or isolate that record from the image. But on the right, we have an image that's a little bit more complicated. There's a black strip on the record cover. And so we had to improve our feature extraction process a lot to try and get it to isolate the full record cover and not just the right side. So these pink outlines are different quadrilaterals that we think are candidate record covers, candidates for the image. On the left, we have a solution that worked well. The full image is present in the picture. And so we were able to isolate that record cover from that image and do this p-hashing technique on it. And correctly predict it. But on the right, we have an image where the top left corners, or top left and right corners are cropped. And so we couldn't isolate the full image from this, or the full record cover from this image. But how did we do? So our accuracy was 51% in classifying these images from 43 different records. Now 51%, it doesn't sound that good at first, but we're looking at 43 different records, collectible records. So our baseline accuracy is just over 2%. 51%, then that's pretty good. But we thought we can do better. So what did we do next? We looked at convolutional neural networks, a more modern approach. We used a pre-trained model that's good at classifying images, and then we added our own layers on top of it to make it even better. Um, but we had a problem. And when training these sorts of models, you need to have lots and lots of data. And we only had one true image from Discogs. We only had one true image of a record cover. So we had to augment the data. We had to increase the number of images. And we created 100 different images for each record. And we tried to improve our techniques over and over so that it matched real world images from Mercari. So that means zooming in, zooming out, stretching and skewing, rotating the images, so that it would match more of what we wanted our model to actually train or to test. So how did we do, Kuma? We got 64%. So we increased from 51 to 64. Again, our baseline, just over 2%. So we're pretty happy with that. Uh, let's look at a couple of the different results. So on the left, we have an image that's both easy to isolate, uh, to extract the feature from for p-hashing, and our neural network did a pretty good job I correctly predicted it. In the middle, we have an image that's a little bit messier. It has a lot of glare on it, and you can see the shadow of a cell phone, but we we're still able to accurately predict that, even though our model never saw an image from Mercari when we were doing all of our training. On the right, we have an image that the p-hashing technique did not accurately predict because we couldn't isolate the entire image. But you can see that our CNN, our neural network, was able to correctly predict this, despite the cropping. We had a couple interesting results as well. The image on the left has two records on it, and we were able to accurately predict one of them. And then the image on the right is really messy. There's the addition of all this text. 
there's this addition of these, these objects that our model never saw in testing, but we were still able to accurately predict. So we were really happy with these results. In the end, real world data is messy and everyone here knows that. But when we were looking at it, we thought, okay, we'll just get the record cover from the image. It'll be easy. And it talk, took a lot of iteration of improving on our extraction techniques, improving on our augmentation to get to the results that we got. It was a great learning process. It was a great opportunity. And lastly, we created a cool tool that we can use for buying new records. Uh, I can use it. I can, we have all this price data as well. And so now I won't need to just sit and click and click and click. I can complete my record collection. Lastly, I would like to thank both Kuma and Kevin. Without their work, none of this would have been possible. And then everyone at Lowagon, all the TAs for this opportunity. Thank you so much. So I said earlier that we had two data science projects today. So it's time for our second and last data science project. So without further ado, let's welcome Axel on stage for HASP. Axel, you're on. Hello, everyone, for the second uh, project of this data science batch, I would like to present HASP, Hazard Alert System for Pedestrians. We all know that there are many groups of people who need extra care or need to take extra care to be safe in traffic or in urban environments. We all need to make sure that we watch out for children. And for example, people who are hard of hearing or who have visual impairments, they need to take extra care to stay safe. In recent years, there is a new risk group in traffic, and that is smartphone users. As the smartphone becomes our window to the wider world, we often lose sight and sound of our immediate surroundings, and this leads to an increase in traffic accidents involving pedestrians. So what can be done about this? Well, first of all, restricting people's use of smartphones in traffic comes to mind, but that's really not practical. People won't let go of their devices. But actually, those, those same devices have microphones, powerful processors, and large batteries, and they have all the parts we need to build a system to continuously monitor the sounds of danger that the users themselves don't notice. Today, we would like to propose a very lightweight machine learning model to classify sounds in urban environments as dangerous or safe as a first building block towards building pedestrian safety applications. Before we present our demo application, we would like to talk a little bit about the data we have used. There's a data set called Urban Sounds 8K that contains almost 9,000 recordings belonging to one of 10 classes from uh, sound events in urban environments. Out of these, we have designated four classes as dangerous sounds. We have dog barks, because we don't want to walk into an angry dog, and Sirens, car horns, and gunshots. All right, so let's look at the application. So let's start with a dog bark. Ah, well, I can assure you that, that that dog has a bite that's worse than its bark. The important part here is the visualization below the playback controls shows us a, a plot of the features that the model actually used to make its classification. And I, we display this to give you an, an image of what, how the various sounds that we classify differ from each other. So now that we've heard or, or tried to hear the dog, and we've seen what the sound looks like, let's classify it to see if we're in danger or if we're safe. We're in danger because it's a dangerous dog. Now let's try with some street music. Well, once again. Hopefully the people on Zoom could hear it, but we will just classify it and learn that, yes, we are not in danger from these three musicians. Let's finish off with a siren. We'll classify it. Let's, let's try another siren. Yes. In, in Japan, ambulances are very polite at street crossings and will drive very slowly, but in other countries, you could be in danger. So, 
back to how did we build this model? Well, first of all, you might have noticed we, we had to uh, balance the data set. I don't know if you noticed the bar graph where we introduced the data, but the gunshot and the car horn classes have much fewer audio files than the other ones. So we need to do something called oversampling, where we randomly make copies of the classes that have fewer samples, and then we augment these using a process that simulates sound being at different distances from the microphone so that we get an equal number of samples for each class. When we have an equal number of samples, now we make, need to take these audio files that are of different lengths and extract from them a single row of numbers that represents the features that we want to learn. We do this by first taking a spectrogram. We slice the file up into little slices, extract frequency information from each slice, and then we have the information about how the frequency changes over time. But this is much too detailed for the model to learn from. So we do a transformation called MFCC, where we compress all the different numbers in the slice to just 13 numbers per slice. But we still have different lengths for different files. So what we do is we take the mean over the time axis, so we just get a single column of 13 numbers for each audio file. But now we lose the information of how the file changes over time. So we take the MFCC and we calculate for each slice how much it changes between the slices. We take what's called the delta. And then we also do another one. We take the delta of the delta and we take the means over the time axis of these. So now we have 13 col three columns of 13 numbers that we combine into a single feature vector of 39 numbers that we can pass to the model for learning. After we have extracted these features, we wanted to see how the, how the classes were distributed. And we can see that in the 10 class problem, when we take all 10 classes, they're very mixed together. And we didn't feel like we could make in our lightweight, simple machine learning model, a good separation of all these classes. So what we did, we took the dangerous classes and combined them into a danger class, and all the safe classes combined them into a safe class. And now while we still have some mixing, we, still, we have a pretty clear grouping of the blue safe classes in the middle and the dangerous classes spread around the edges and concentrated towards the lower left. And when we saw this, that we had got this good separation in the plot, we were pretty confident that we could make a good model. So how did we do? Well, we had a test set of uh, data that was not involved in the training, and we validated that with a dummy model, a simple logistic regression model, and then our final support vector classifier model. The dummy model just outputs dangerous for every sound, and it gets an accuracy of 33% because that's how many actual dangerous sounds there was in the test set. Uh, the logistic regression model is better. I won't go into the detail, but it is not as good as our SBC model. Now, why is this SBC model so much better? The important number is precision and recall. The recall tells us how many of the dangerous sounds in the test set that were actually picked up by the model. And we get 74% for those, which means that this model could help prevent three out of four accidents due to somebody not hearing uh, a dangerous sound and therefore running into a dangerous situation. Also, the precision tells us how many of the sounds classified as dangerous are actually from a dangerous class. And here we can see that with this model, four out of five times that we say that something is dangerous, there is actually an hazard to be attentive to. So we are not absolutely spamming the user with spurious alerts. Now, going forward, uh, first of all, the conclusion, we think that we have shown that training a lightweight ML model is a viable, viable approach for classifying specific urban sounds. And this uh, we would like to take forward into next step, although the uh, boot camp is over. But if we had more data, and most specifically commercial data, because this data cannot be used in commercial applications, and we could implement the classification and feature extraction as a smartphone app, we could very well make an application that users could have running on their phone continuously, giving them alerts about 
dangerous sounds in their environment when they're walking along reading happy news on their phones. And furthermore, sounds are different in different areas. So in different regions of the world, we're going to want different sounds as dangerous, different sounds as safe. And, safe. and therefore, we need to uh, deploy the training pipeline as a service where users could train their own custom models for staying safe in their environment. Right, lastly, I, will, I want to thank my teammates, uh, Shigiri and Parkland. We had great fun making this project, and we are very happy to share it here to you, today with you. And we would like to thank the TAs and all the staff of Oregon, and we would like to thank you for listening to our presentation. Thank you.